So here in Isaiah, this is the first of what we call the suffering servant passages. God is talking. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow weak or discouraged before he has established justice on the earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. His chosen one, his servant. Now remember, this is um, a prophecy. This is a revelation that God is making to the second Isaiah or a follower of Isaiah's during the Babylonian captivity, which would be between five and 600 years before the birth of Christ. And yet he's clearly talking about a chosen one of his. Now, in fact, this bruised reed he will not break might sound familiar to you. Because if you look at that particular chapter, and here we are at my favorite site, Bible Hub, it gives you cross-references. You can click on Matthew 12, 20. And then you click on the context here, God's chosen servant here in Matthew 12. Matthew says to us, Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them all, warning them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. And he quotes this, what I just read to you, including, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not extinguish, till he leads justice to victory, and in his name the nations will put their hope. So, by the way, here I am today in the Bat Cave. That's because I'm Batman, but don't tell anybody. So, even in the Gospels, the inspired evangelists who wrote them pointed back to the Old Testament, in particular Isaiah. Many passages in Isaiah seem to predict a coming Savior, even as far back as Genesis, right after the fall. God predicts that one will come from the seed of the woman who will bruise the uh, crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent will lash out. We are, we are told by Moses that a one greater than he will come, greater than Moses. And so we have these many messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about what happens here in the Magnificat. If you go to Bible Hub, you can get these great parallels with the original language. Now, I'm going to the top here. My soul magnifies the Lord. This is Mary's Magnificat that is patterned upon and reminds us of Hannah's song, which we read a few days ago. Now, sometimes the translations will say, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. The New Living Translation, which is more of a um, paraphrase, Mary responded, oh, how my soul praises the Lord. But most English translations will tell you and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, magnifies, magnifies. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My soul exalts the Lord is the New American Standard Bible. But you can go down to the original Greek that, that Luke was written in. And you see, my soul magnifies is the Greek word megalieni, which means I enlarge or lengthen. I increase, magnify, extol, from megas to make great increase or extol. So you can say, my soul increases the Lord, my soul glorifies the Lord, but magnify is a good translation. And to me, that's always been meaningful because all saints, including you and me, kids, are supposed to magnify the Lord by what we do and what we say. We are supposed to be like a magnifying lens so that when people look at us, it's like looking at an icon. I don't have any icons per se. I do have this photograph that I took of a stained uh, glass, a painted glass, stained glass image of Mary at a church here in the Archdiocese of St. Louis. 
when you look at this beautiful representation of Mary, it should connect you to the glory of God, her humility, her virtue, her willingness to cooperate with God's grace. It doesn't end with Mary. Mary's not saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. She's saying, my soul magnifies the Lord. You will see God greater through me. He will be enlarged through me. She's saying, I'm glorifying him, I'm extolling him, I'm praising him, but she's also saying, I will make him more well known. I will make his glory more evident and abundant. The same glory that the Jews lost back in 1 Samuel when the Ark of the Covenant is stolen. Now, I'm putting up another link here today on Moodle, uh, and I'll probably link to it on YouTube if I remember to, here in the comments, not in the comments, in the little description section. A pretty interesting video about the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God, which, as I say, was present there in Shiloh and which was present with the Jews, beginning with Moses as the people made their way through the wilderness. And here now, several hundred years after Moses, the Ark is still among them until now. And the Philistines run off with it as they defeat the Israelites. Why are the Israelites defeated? Well, clearly we know because of what we read yesterday or on Friday, whenever you read it, we know that the Philistines were defeated because this is part of God's punishment because of the behavior of Hophni and Phinehas who both get done away with in the battle. So that same glory we are told is absent from the people of God so that the child born by uh, whoever it is, I think Phineas's a widow, is called Ichabod. And the word means the glory of God is gone from Israel, gone from his people. Because quite literally, the presence of God in the ark has been captured. But God's glory can leave us in other ways. It can leave us when we sin. It can be absent from our hearts. We can not be sure who he is. We can be in a bad mood. There are many ways to lose the glory of God. But Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord. My soul lengthens the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. Through me, the glory of God can more clearly be seen and will return. And that's quite literally what happens with the incarnation. But it can also happen through any saint. People should look at us, Christians, and see God more clearly as if through a lens. They shouldn't look at us and worship us and stop with us. Our images should be um, like lenses. Through us, they should see God more clearly. And of course, I'm sorry to say, most people who make a loud noise about being Catholic or Christian do just the opposite. And people look at them and through them and their selfish, pitiful behavior, God is lessened. It's like looking through the wrong end of a telescope, not the right end. And God appears to be without glory because of the selfish lack of glory of many of our fellow Christians and sometimes because of us and our own behavior. And so try to be like Mary. We will never be sinless or perfect, but we can always pray the Magnificat. Notice as well that there's an upside down that happens. There's a reversal in Mary's song. The rich will be sent empty away. Those who are comfortable, the fat cats will be starved a little bit, and the poor and lowly and the humble will be made greater because God cares about those that are perhaps not as noticeable in our own human eyes. And we hear more about that even in 1 Samuel. We hear more about how God works through the sorts of people we might ignore from our own human point of view. Anyway, all of that's going on in today's readings. As you can see, there's a lot going on in every day's readings. I got to get back to work. Robin is waiting for me. <laughs>